Well, when I'm thinking what to tell you about uh, the situation in Germany right now, I am a little bit um, seduced to look back to summer 2005 when I arrived in the United States uh, with my wife. Looking back, one could say that 2005, the year we arrived, was a year in which the political tides were turning. <coughs> and in retrospect, I wonder about our ability to read a situation, to see the signs, to understand the driving forces of a given moment in time, and to predict the next developments. The year before, 2004, had been a very good year for the US economy. George W. Bush had been re-elected for a second term, and then came 2005, the year when the number of attacks against the US military in Iraq was sharply rising, the year when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, the year that set the course for a huge victory of the Democrats at the midterm election 2006. They took the House and the Senate, and two years later, the White House. So if we could all agree that 2005 was a year when the tide was turning, the next question would be, did we see it coming at that time? Or did we make our projections for the future under the impression of the convincing re-election victory of George W. Bush and the parallel success of the Republicans in the congressional election? Who would have thought at that time that the administration was that badly prepared to meet the challenge of mounting sectarian violence in Iraq or the challenge of Hurricane Katrina. The outcome, one could arc, was not fate, was not the result of unsurmountable adversary forces, but rather the consequence of a lacking ability to respond in an adequate way. I tend not to draw the parallel to Europe right now. This was rather meant as an introductory reflection, but it might be applicable as well to the subject of our discussion today, Germany, in 2016, a somewhat strange country, since the familiar behavior of its government and its citizens is challenged by a number of surprising dynamics. But while I was thinking what to tell you about the current mood in Germany, I could not help to remind myself of my own experience in the US in 2005. Right now, Germany finds itself at a moment in time when the tides are turning. My country has to deal with several challenges of historical proportions. First of all, an influx of migrants Germany has never seen before, probably more than one million people <coughs> in 2015 alone. And there is no sign that this flow will recede soon, even if the number of new arrivals would go down. Most of those who are here already plan to bring their family members, which they left behind. Second, we see a crisis of trust in German trademarks like Volkswagen and Deutsche Bank. Third, a time of weakness of European institutions and maybe even an unraveling of the integration process. We have the Euro crisis, the Greek crisis, they are both not over. We see a war in Ukraine and generally an assertive Russia. We see the looming risk of a Britain exit from the European Union. And on top of it came the refugee crisis. At the moment, Europe does not give convincing answers to any of these challenges. Since summer 2013, that's two and a half years by now, I am back in Germany. I came back to a country that was pretty self-confident. Germany managed the global crisis quite well, and it was proud of it. Just a decade earlier, The Economist had labeled my country famously as the sick man of the euro. According to that narrative, Germany was complacent and its economy was old-fashioned. Too much manufacturing, too little service industries, especially too little financial service industry. But in 2009 and 2010, Germany managed the global crisis better than other countries thanks to this allegedly old-fashioned structure of the economy. Germany became the strongman of the euro and the strongman of Europe. This proud self-perception has changed over the last two years. The Euro crisis, the Greece crisis, the war in Ukraine challenged the German self-assuredness and on top of it came Volkswagen emission scandal and the crisis of Deutsche Bank. This did not mean that Germany felt weak itself. <laughs> Germany rather became accustomed to the feeling that Europe became weaker and weaker and to the fact that Germany showed still strength like an island in a turbulent ocean. However, at that time, the experience of these several crises did not have a negative impact on Germany's self-perception. They showed the limits of Europe's influence, 
and of Germany's influence as a part of this weaker Europe. Europe was not able to prevent or confront Russian aggression. Europe was not able to convince Greece of a responsible dealing with its public finances. And at the same time, most people felt that our federal government was working hard to deal with these challenges in a responsible way. In real life, Germany did not become the malevolent hegemon of the caricatures in some newspapers. Germany tried to keep Europe together and took a middle way in order to do so. Time and again, it showed the willingness to make compromises which it, it would, with its EU partners. Now, fast forward to early 2016. Right now, I'm visiting from a country which is not sure at all about its state of the <coughs> Union. Two different tales are competing publicly. On one hand, we see a Germany that is in deep, deep trouble. A seemingly unstoppable influx, influx of migrants, the Volkswagen emission scandal, the crisis of Deutsche Bank, the inability to build a new airport in Berlin, just to name a few problems and failures. On the other hand, we see a Germany that is rising to the challenges, that applies <coughs> goodwill, that uses its virtues to solve problems, for example, the technical skills of its engineers, the competence of its well-trained agencies, and a Germany that is willing to throw long-held convictions overboard, like the belief that we are not an immigration country. I might be wrong, but I assume that most people in the US are not aware of the depth of Germany's crisis of self-confidence, for understandable reasons. First of all, the positive can-do attitude sounds much more familiar to Americans and is in sync with their approach to a challenge. Second, it seems, it seems to be part of the national stereotypes around the globe that Germans are able to solve problems. Whether we talk about the general image of the country, democracy, state of law, public order, or about cars, engineering, beer, and soccer, Germany has a good reputation. People trust in the trademark made in Germany. This trust, or this national stereotype, however you want to call it, has been a source of national pride for the most time. But since it was so central to Germany's self-perception, the psychological consequences are also grave when this belief is called into question. And that is exactly what has been happening over recent months. The Volkswagen emission scandal is central to this change of mood. From an American perspective, this might sound surprising. On the US market, Volkswagen is not such a big player. In 2014, the brand sold 370,000 cars in the US, that's a market share of just 2.2%. But this disruption comes shortly after Volkswagen overtook Toyota as the best-selling car company of the world. Now, just a few months later, the consequences of the emission scandal could lead to bankruptcy of the whole Volkswagen company. In the US alone, Volkswagen risks to pay $18 billion in fines. On top comes the cost of the product recall and the repairs of the flawed technique. Volkswagen has to count as well with class actions. That sounds like a bounty for lawyers in this country. <laughs> but the US is just one national market for Volkswagen, and it's not the biggest one. In Europe alone, approximately 8 million cars are affected by the problem. And wherever you look, this challenge means additional complications. Risks in China were already rising before the emission scandal broke, so it is difficult to imagine that Volkswagen could counterbalance the negative effects of the scandal in one market, the US, by success in a different market, for example, China. Volkswagen is not just any German company. It is perceived as one of the most German companies of all, for several reasons. Just look at the ownership structure. The state of Lower Saxony holds 20% and has veto rights in major decisions. Here in the US, one could see that Volkswagen was following a very specific business strategy, a German strategy. In contrast to its competitors, it was betting on diesel, not on hybrid technique like Toyota or on e-mobility. In the fact sheets, that made perfectly sense. Cars with diesel engines consume about 30% less than a comparable car that runs on gas. That is good for the purse of the diesel driver. It is good as well for energy security, for the environment, and for a responsible use of national resources. There was just one big problem. The image of diesel in the US. Diesel stinks, diesel cars are slow and dirty. Volkswagen took great lengths to change that image. They took an Audi racing car with diesel engine, 
that won the famous 24 hours in Le Mans on a road tour, road tour through the US. The message, diesel is fast, diesel has torque, diesel is economic, <coughs> diesel is fun, and in addition, diesel is clean. This is the reason why the emission scandal is so devastating. It affects the rebranding of diesel in the US. And since diesel had a central role in the strategy, how Volkswagen overtook Toyota as the best-selling car company worldwide, the consequences are huge. In the public perception, Volkswagen broke several promises. Made in Germany might be a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it. Our engineering is better, we don't cheat. Our diesel engines are clean. Just imagine other German car companies would be accused of cheating. The backlash for the image of Made in Germany would be dangerous. And since car companies are an important part of the German economy, such a backlash would be felt all over Germany. Volkswagen is not the only example of a multinational company from Germany with troubles. Another is Deutsche Bank. The new CEO, John Ryan, gave a blood, sweat and tears speech last autumn. Deutsche Bank will shed thousands of jobs in Germany and worldwide. They will not pay a dividend for at least two years. Earlier we had Siemens and its problems with compliance rules. With every additional scandal, the feeling is spreading that this is not about one or another individual company. The whole German business model is under challenge. And Germany might have problems with its national brand made in Germany. On top of all of this came the migration crisis. Again, Americans might have a different perspective. <coughs> the US is a country of immigrants. So most Americans perceive the long-held German belief that Germany is not an immigration country as hopelessly old thinking. Many Americans cheered when they heard that Germany opened its borders for refugees. Finally, the Germans came to their senses. In Germany, however, you have a split screen. The, uh, the public is divided in several camps. It is far more complicated than the typical narrative of the mass media that there is a dark Germany and a bright Germany. A dark Germany, represented by the demonstrations of Pegida, an anti-Islamic movement founded in Dresden, and some neo-Nazis which refused to accept reality, by German criminals who set welcome centers for migrants on fire. And there is a bright Germany, represented by many, many people of goodwill, welcoming refugees at border crossings and train stations with flowers, with toys for children, with cloths, blankets, and a hot soup. And by volunteers that help out in many cities across the country. I'm very happy that we see this face of Germany as well, a Germany that reacts more welcoming than two decades ago when we faced the Balkan Wars and an influx of hundreds of thousands of refugees at that time as well. <coughs> at that time, Germany did not show Willkommenskultur. But the dark Germany and the bright Germany are just the surface, a media narrative. They tell you little about the real mood in the country. In a Deutschland trend poll from the beginning of February, 80% say the mass migration is out of control. Nevertheless, over 90% still agree that Germany should take asylum seekers in. But the number goes down significantly if there is a suspicion that the migrants don't flee from threats to their lives, but rather come for economic reasons. Two thirds of the Germans want to see an Obergrenze, a ceiling how many refugees Germany can accept per year. In Germany itself, it is difficult these days to get the feeling that the country has embarked on a journey to a brighter future by taking in so many migrants. What Germans see every evening on the news is chaos, is rage, is a loss of control, and a growing number of incidents where not the Germans, but the new arrivals act in an unacceptable way. You have probably heard about the incidents on New Year's Eve in Cologne and in other cities, with sexual assaults on young German women, and about the continuing stalking of teenagers in shopping malls, again in a sexually explicit way. We see frequent thefts of purses and cell phones. And we see a discomforting lack of solidarity of our EU partners. The migration crisis is a challenge for the whole of Europe, Germans would say, a challenge that we should face together. But most of our EU partners do not agree. From their point of view, Germany's behavior is the reason why the number of refugees became almost unmanageable. When the number of refugees was growing and growing and smaller EU countries on the so-called Balkan route, like Hungary, were saying that they can't manage anymore, 
Chancellor Merkel sends a signal in the last days of August that all refugees are welcome to Germany. Probably that was not what she meant to say, but this is how it was communicated through Facebook, Twitter and the media. And Merkel decided not to clarify. In contrary, she even doubled down. She said that German asylum law, that the German asylum law does not know any Obergrenze, any ceiling. Which is, in a literary sense, true of course. The German law does not state victims of political persecution are granted <laughs> asylum, but this applies only to number X per year, let's say a 100,000. But however, politically, such a statement that there are no limits had consequences. Germans are now complaining that the rest of Europe shows not enough solidarity. But the European partners would respond, Germany is a culprit. Germany started to ignore European solidarity. We had an agreed system in place, the so-called Dublin Accord. The first EU country a refugee sets foot has to register this refugee and to process his or her demand for asylum or refugee status. If such a status is refused, the applicant has to be sent back. If entry to the EU is granted, Europe has to decide how the refugees will be distributed among the member states. Truth to be told, the Dublin system never worked. Southern states like Italy and Greece used to turn a blind eye on incoming refugees and were happy if they found their way further north on their own. In the first half of 2015, and that is where we have numbers, we had a paradox situation. Of the half million migrants who applied for asylum or refugee status in the first half of 2015, Germany registered 40%, also Germany has not an outer border of the European Union which means they traveled through several EU countries that showed no interest to do their duty and to register them. The main migration routes, routes reach the EU in Italy and in Greece. Italy registered 7%. Greece registered 1.5%. So it is true, Germany has, to, has decided to abandon the system de facto unilaterally without consultation with its partners. That happened when Chancellor Merkel told Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban at the end of August to let the refugees, which were assembled under inhuman conditions at the Budapest railway station, to travel north to Germany. And most perceived it at that time at a very humanitarian decision, <coughs> but maybe it was perceived at a once-in-time decision and not as a general opening of the borders, but that's, that's what happened afterwards. In the following weeks and months, up to 10,000 refugees per day were entering the EU. And every country on the so-called Balkan route, whether it's Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia or Slovenia, excuses itself by saying, we are too small to deal with this influx. We have only two alternatives. Either we command our armed forces to guard the border, even with force if necessary, or we let them in and lead them on their way to the north, to Germany, because that is where they want to go anyway. <coughs> this can't go on for much longer. It's just a question of time when Germany will be overwhelmed. A weaker administration system than the very efficient German system would have given up long ago. However, Germany had to admit during the winter even the German authorities were not able to register every arriving person, not to talk about processing them orderly. The truth is, we don't know how many people have arrived exactly, <coughs> who they are, and where they live right now. All over, all over the country, we have by now many thousands living in tents or other provisory housing. We see a lot of aggression. Refugees are complaining how badly Germany is, is prepared. You knew that we, we were coming, they would shout into TV cameras. <laughs> They complain that they were promised a house and a car and a job when they left Syria or refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon or Turkey. Well, if I were one of those facilitators or human smugglers charging 5,000 euro for passage, I would probably make similar promises. Since we don't know who is coming and what education and skills they bring, we also do not know to which degree the claim is true that the immigrants are a solution to one of Germany's biggest problems demographic change. The German society has a low birth rate and is aging. Business is afraid that there will be a shortage of skilled labor in the future. It might be true that mass immigration could be a part of the solution if we train them properly, if we do a better job integrating them into our society than we did with the so-called Gastarbeiter of earlier generations. But for the time being, 
we see the opposite and we send the wrong messages. First studies under those who arrived recently estimate that just 10 to 15 percent come with an education the German economy could use. Some speak some English, almost nobody speaks German. They come with unrealistic expectations and seemingly with a low willingness to adapt to the German system of values such as gender equality, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Almost every day we see news about clashes at refugee centers between migrants and news about pe angry people throwing stones at the German police. There is, of course, an irony in the situation. The mass influx of refugees into Germany is the backside of Germany's nation branding as a well-functioning country. Made in Germany was well respected. Germany is perceived as being a can-do society, a country able to solve problems. The Chancellor and her coalition <coughs> government will hold up their promise. Wir schaffen das. Yes, we can. Of course they do. Even if they don't believe their own promise, they have to keep saying it. On one hand, with respect to the regional elections in a few days from now, on March 13, in Baden-Württemberg, Rheinland-Pfalz and Sachsen-Anhalt. It has never been paying off to declare a change of course a few weeks ahead of an election. Voters don't like that even if the same voters don't like the course either and see a need to change it. On the other hand, the government has to <coughs> confirm wir schaffen das, yes we can, with regard to all the volunteers. If even the government would start to lament that we are overwhelmed, it would be the end of a positive attitude of all the volunteers and the public servants in the lender and in the communities where most of the practical integration work is done. But the big question remains, even if officially unspoken. <coughs> what are we doing here? Are we open-minded or are we just naive? Will we be able to deal with the unforeseen situation? Well, we have to rise to the challenge. And I'm pretty sure that we will see a change, of course, after the three elections on March 13th and an additional EU summit just a few days later that will probably bring again little progress. And the same is true for the EU summit, which started on Sunday and was, mm -hmm. is uh, still in action right now and prolonged for a day. And that means the answer has to be a dual strategy. On one hand, wir schaffen das should continue to be the mindset for the challenge of welcoming and integrating migrants. On the other hand, wir schaffen das should also become the mindset for reducing the number of new arrivals to a more manageable level. Our European neighbors get nervous when they see a Germany that dismisses practical considerations, whose actions seem to be governed rather by the sake of a principle than by pragmatism. A Germany that does not seem to remember the wisdom enshrined in the Roman law principle ultra posse nemo obligator. You can't ask more from a person or an institution than this person or institution is able to deliver. In the short run, Germany is in trouble. In the long run, I'm a little bit more optimistic. The encouraging thing about Western societies is not that they do not make mistakes. We know better. They do mis make mistakes, lots of mistakes. Encouraging is that they are able to correct mistakes more often <coughs> and quicker than authoritarian forms of government. So I'm confident that public pressure will force <coughs> the German government to correct its approach to the migration challenge. Mass immigration is not a phenomenon that a country has to endure passively. A country should be able to steer immigration, at least to a certain degree. For example, one could counter the propaganda of the human smugglers that it's worth to pay thousands of euro for illegal passage to Germany because everybody will get a house and a car and a job. One could start to send counter-information. Refugees arriving in Germany telling in their language how the real situation is, accompanied by pictures of tents and the long queues in front of the Sozialamt. One could send the message that yes, you can enter Germany through the official border crossings, and yes, you can register there as a refugee or apply for political asylum, but no, you can't cross borders wherever you want, bypassing the registration process. And no, it is not free choice in which EU country and which city a refugee gets ref refuge. It is the right of the EU and each member state to send a refugee to a certain place. How would Germany do that? Build up the border guard again, after letting them shrink when we made the decision that there will be no more passport control inside the Schengen area. The build up of the border guard might take time. 
In the meantime, the Bundeswehr could help out. To secure the national border in an extreme situation is one of the reasons why a country maintains armed forces. This does not mean that you have to shoot on refugees. That is normally the first complaint. Then uh, if you say, well, put the army on the borders, that means you want to shoot at refugees. No, not at all. They, they are able to, to control the border. I, I'm pretty sure when you talk to them. Um, so secure the national borders. That's, that would be a, a, a wise thing to do. We have to regain control over the chaotic din dynamic. The European Union will also be under pressure to change its behavior, and probably at foremost, again, Germany, its behavior inside the European Union. The distrust in European solutions is growing fast wherever you look. The support for populist and right-wing parties is growing almost everywhere, in Sweden, the Netherlands, Great Britain, France, Poland, Hungary. Only Germany seems still to react allergic against right-wing movements. But the March elections will probably deal a blow to this helpful, hopeful perception, especially in Sachsen-Anland. There is a neat saying about the European Union. The integration process works like a bicycle. Either you manage to move forward, or the bicycle will tip over. An open question is how quickly one or the other will happen, and how much damage will be done before it happens. Denial of the challenge remains the biggest risk but denial will not work forever. As it looks right now, Germany is not successful with its pitch that other EU countries should join our Willkommenskultur and the policy of open borders. The few allies Germany had at the beginning have been changing course over recent months. Sweden, Denmark, Austria. It is getting lonely around Germany. So what do you do if you want to be a leader if you are supp supposed to be a leader in the perception of your partners, but nobody wants to follow your lead. <laughs> Probably there is no other way than to change course yourself. At the Munich Security Conference, not this year, but last year, the German Secretary of Defense, Ursula von der Leyen, made some headlines when she described the German role in Europe as leading from the middle. She was a bit ridiculed and asked what that is supposed to mean, leading from the middle. But there might be a hidden truth in it. You can't lead if nobody wants to follow you because you are too far from a middle ground with your partners. The recognition that Germany might be close to being isolated with its migration policy in the EU sinks slowly in in Germany. I assume that after the election shock on March 13th and another failed EU summit, the Chancellor and the German public will be ready to try <coughs> something else. I am confident that Volkswagen will learn its lesson. They will find a technical fix for the emission test manipulation, and they might be able to reduce the fines in talks with the EPA to levels that do not pose a risk for the existence of the company. I'm confident that Deutsche Bank corrects its course of action and will become profitable again. So it's obvious we are living in interesting times. Germany finds itself as a crossroad, and Europe finds itself as a crossroad. It might be that in five years from now, we might look back and say, summer 2015 was a moment when Chancellor Angela Merkel made her big mistake, the mistake that brought down her government. And summer 2015 was a moment in which it became clear that a united Europe was just a nice dream and that the EU started falling, falling apart slowly. The compromise for the Greece crisis did not work out and Greece had to leave the euro. The unity versus Russian aggression did not stay strong enough. Over the course of 2016, the EU was not able to find consensus to continue the sanctions. And the EU, EU was also not able to deal with the migration crisis. The member states put national egoism above European solidarity. And in retrospect, it might be that 2015 was a year in which the Volkswagen emission scandal accelerated the doubts about the qualities of Made in Germany. In addition, all these uh, events together led to the consequence that a majority of the British did not see convincing advantages of a UK membership in the EU and opted to leave the Union, which led to a second Scottish referendum and the breaking apart of the United Kingdom. <laughs> All this is possible. It is not even far-fetched. But this scenario is not fate. Germany, the German industry and Europe are still able to avoid such a development. Hopefully, Chancellor Merkel 
will acknowledge the threat and put into effect the dual strategy I try to outline. A strategy that combines an efficient welcoming and integration process with an approach to get the number of arrivals down to a manageable level. Hopefully the EU member states will come to understand that the unraveling of the EU will not only harm an abstract European idea, but also runs counter to their national interest. Because in a global world, falling back to the level of uncoordinated nation states would ultimately take away their common ability to influence the direction of international development. Western societies, Western leaders do make mistakes. The question is whether they are able to correct them and how quickly. The US made recently that experience. In 2008, the US economy, its banking system, its insurance giants and car companies were close to the brink, but they came back. One of Tom Friedman's books has an inspiring title. That used to be us. How America fell behind in the world it invented and how it could, could can come back. I'm pretty sure that Germany <clears throat> can come back from its self-esteem crisis. I'm a bit more concerned about the European Union. If we had the American spirit, somebody would take the lead and declare we are living in challenging times, but we are not done yet. Thank you.